The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to be thinking and criminalize uh, uh, our own To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Bellville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Ross Belleville. All right. Good day, Tokers and Tokettes. Welcome. It is Thursday, October 11th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. And by the way, today, 10, 11, 12 is the last sequentially numbered day in the American MMDDYY date coding system until January 2nd, 2034, which is 21 years, two months, and 22 days away. I know you were just dying to know that, weren't you? Let's go to our virtual studio where waiting there for us is our news director, Carrie Gallagher. Hello, Carrie. Hi, Russ. How's it going? Very good. You can see I've been crunching nerdy stats all day. Of course, that's what you do. That's how you roll. That's how I roll. And how Carrie rolls is by doing our hemp headlines right at the first break here. Right if we get back from the first break, we give you all the latest news going down in the world of cannabis. So, Carrie, what do we got in the news today? Uh, Well, today I'm going to give you a report on those Colorado uh, patient numbers. You know, they've been uh, declining over the last year and a half or so. Also, you know, we spent the entire day in Long Beach. We just missed the action one day later. There were some raids. I'm going to tell you about that. But first up, uh, Oakland, the city of Oakland, has made a pretty strong statement uh, in what they think about Harborside Health care center versus the feds all right we're looking forward to that suit also uh toward the tail end of the news we got some new data coming out of washington state that further bolsters the case for passing i-502 dr harry levine's data from queen's college in new york brand new report out on marijuana arrests in washington state then after that we'll get behind the headlines i'm going to take a look at the headlines all over the new york times about lance armstrong the uh now disgraced seven-time tour de france champion uh who's been uh you know, ale- alleged to have been doping and uh, using performance enhancing and drugs throughout his whole career. I'm going to get to the bottom of this and ask the pertinent question, which is, why do we ban performance enhancing drugs in the first place? Then at our daily Toker tunes at 20 after, it's it's Groovin' Thursday, and Timmy Harris, aka Big Daddy Fink, has sent me some new music from Big from the uh, Big Fat Your Mama's Big Fat Booty Band. So many long names there, I get them all confused. And then at half past, we are going to get a legalization legislation update by showing you the panel on legalization initiatives that took place at the Normal National Conference in LA. It features I-502's Rick Steves, it features Amendment 64's Brian Vincente, it features Measure 80's Roy Kaufman, and, for good measure, Drug Policy Alliance's Ethan Nadelman, moderated by Keith Straub. It's all coming up next on The Russ Belville Show. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Honey, our ballots came in the mail today. I can't wait to cast my vote for Measure 80. Measure 80? Is that the one to legalize marijuana? I don't know about that. Why not? Marijuana is far safer than alcohol. 
I know that, but I worry about kids smoking pot. It's easier for kids to buy pot than beer because clerks check for proper ID. Sure, but what about stone drivers? We've had medical marijuana for 14 years, and yet our traffic safety stats are better now than before medical marijuana. Okay, but what about people coming in stone to work? Come on now, honey. Oregon's workplaces are safer than ever, and we have over 50,000 medical marijuana patients. Nothing about Measure 80 prevents employers from maintaining drug-free workplaces. I know change is scary, but Oregon really needs jobs and tax revenue, and Measure 80 will provide them. Okay, safer for kids and tax revenue for our state? Makes sense to me. I'm voting yes on Measure 80. Paid for by Oregonians for law reform, OregonLawReform.com. Wiz Coleco's wallet and cell phone are missing. Again. And Taco Bell's already been searched. we got to look somewhere. Sir, do you think there will or should come a time for us to discuss the possibility of legalization, regulation, and control of all drugs, thereby doing away with the violent criminal market as well as a major source of funding for international terrorism? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. President. Well, I think this is an uh, entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Name the time and place, Mr. President. Radical Russ has been prepping for this debate full-time since 2005. The Russ Belleville Show. Now it's time for our 420 headline news with our news director, Carrie Gallagher. City of Oakland, California chooses sides in the Harborside Health Care Center versus the federal government this week. California's most prominent medical marijuana dispensary has been the target of a federal authority crackdown on the medical cannabis industry. Harborside Health Center, the dispensary that was featured on the Discovery Channel's reality show Weed Wars, was served federal property forfeiture papers in July. Harborside owner Steve D'Angelo has been fighting to keep his doors open ever since. Now the city of Oakland is stepping in and lending some support by suing to keep U.S. authorities from closing down the business. Oakland City Attorney Barbara Parker has asked a federal judge to declare as unlawful the federal government's latest attempts. The action filed yesterday in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California names U.S. Attorney Melinda Hogg and U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder as defendants and asked that they be barred from acting against the clinic that is operating under city laws and paying taxes. The lawsuit does not, however, seek any damages. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment says that the number of medical marijuana patients in the state is back up after an all-time high in September of 2011. The most recent count is from July of this year that shows Colorado once again has topped 100,000 medical marijuana patients registered with 101,220 finally reaching that mark after adding 1,260 patients since the previous month. The trend, though, has been that the numbers are increasing from new patients, so that increase from June to July was lower for those with active red cards than new patient applications. At least 276 people who were cardholders in June did not renew their cards or were booted off the registry. Colorado has an all-time high of patients enrolled in the program in June of 2011 with 128,690. Since then, the numbers have dipped down to 80,000 at one time. The figures showed that 9.6% of patients in Colorado designated a caregiver to grow marijuana for them, while 43.6% signed up with the Medical Marijuana Center. And while Russ and I were stuck in the Long Beach airport, all the action in was happening at two medical marijuana growing operations in a collective where more than 40 arrests were made. The Press-Telegraph in Long Beach, California is reporting that the DEA and the Long Beach Police Department conducted the coordinated raids on both locations at 1 p.m. The two locations had been deemed uninhabitable by the Long Beach Fire Department. The Long Beach Green Room Medical Marijuana Collective, located at 7th and Rose Avenue, was raided where a 54-year-old patient, along with several employees, were detained for an hour. When the patient was released, he was asked if he could take his medicine that he had just purchased with him, and the police replied, nope, we're taking it all. This raid is just the latest on the crackdown on medical marijuana in Long Beach, California, where dispensaries have been banned entirely since August. The city had worked for two years to draft regulations and permits for medical marijuana dispensaries, but then banned them entirely when a court ruling said the city could not regulate marijuana because it was against federal law. Although that ruling is being challenged, the city council voted to ban medical marijuana businesses as opposed to letting them open unregulated and unchecked in the community. 
Thank you, Kerry. And uh, I also have some news here from uh, Dr. Harry Levine of Queens College, New York, who has released some stunning data about the costs of marijuana prohibition in Washington state that would be addressed by the passage of Initiative 502, the measure to legalize marijuana. Dr. Levine reports that since 2001, over 129,000 Washingtonians have been arrested for marijuana possession, costing the state between 194 and 258 million dollars. Furthermore, 70 percent of those arrested for marijuana a possession were below the age of 30 and they were disproportionately non-white. Blacks were arrested at a rate 2.5 times greater than their share of the population. Despite using marijuana at rates similar to whites, blacks are 2.9 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession in Washington than whites are. Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans combined make up only 14% of Washington's population, but 25% of those arrested for marijuana possession. Those arrested for marijuana possession face serious impediments to future employment, education, and other life opportunities. Defending a marijuana possession case can cost the accused over $4,000 or the services of a public defender that the taxpayers subsidize. Despite having a medical marijuana law, arrests are over twice as prevalent as before the law passed in 1998. It's time to put police back on the streets fighting real crime by voting yes on I-502. And that's your 420 headline news for Thursday, October 11th, 2012. I'm Russ Belleville for Kerry Gallagher. When we come back, we go behind the headlines on the doping allegations of Lance Armstrong. We're back after this. Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. Cannaboids and health. Cannabinoids. 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 Why am I having trouble saying that? Cannabinoids. Jeez. <laughs> oh, Cannabinoids. Oh, uh, what a gift. Welcome back. It's time for us to go behind the headlines. And today in my drug testing feed, I get the news from the New York Times about the latest on Lance Armstrong. Now, if you haven't been following, Lance Armstrong is the seven-time world champion Tour de France uh, bicyclist. And, uh, of course, he's just been uncovered in this doping scandal amongst him and his other uh, U.S. Postal Service teammates. Uh, the evidence coming out now seems overwhelming that uh, Armstrong was involved in various blood doping and EPO and other involvements. They say uh, he used EPO, testosterone, corticosteroid, human growth hormone, and blood doping. And uh, blood doping, of course, being the practice of being able to transfuse your own blood uh, to boost your red cell count uh, in order to transport more oxygen, make yourself a better athlete, especially in a cardiovascular sport such as cycling. And Every time these sort of stories come up with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency and the World Anti-Doping Agency, I always have to come back to the, the, the base question of this, which is why do we make the use of performance enhancing drugs illegal in the first place or if not illegal banned within the world and national sporting arenas i just don't understand why this is an issue every excuse that's ever brought to me in this argument uh fails the smell test to me it just doesn't make any sense to me uh one point that's often brought up is that we need to have a uh, purity of the sport to make sure that people aren't cheating, that somehow the use of a performance enhancing chemical or drug uh, is cheating in some sort of way. And I, I just don't understand, aside from the fact that it being against the rules and people who are breaking the rules are by definition cheating, I don't understand the ethical part of why we have the rule in the first place. Why is it cheating for someone to use testosterone or EPO or blood doping? Because according to this report, not only was Lance Armstrong involved in doing this, but many other cyclists on his team and on other teams were involved in doing these same sorts of techniques. So if we have a group of people all involved in the same level of blood doping, then what is the 
what 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 are we what are we solving by trying to prevent them and a futile attempt to try to prevent them from doing so? Apparently, given a bunch of world class cyclists all doing these various blood doping uh, techniques, Lance Armstrong still kicked all their ass. Right, Lance Armstrong still beat them seven times in a row. You could give me all the EPO, testosterone, anything you want. Hell, give me amphetamines. It wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. I'm never going to be a world-class cyclist. And 90% of those world-class cyclists out there, given the same drugs, obviously could not compete at the same level as Lance Armstrong and some of his teammates. So as far as it being fair, if everyone is doing it, and we still see some people excelling greater than others at those same levels, how is that still not a demonstration of their overall athletic talent? Given that they're all doing it, that they're all doping here, and still some rise above others, that is indicative of their talent. Now, people will complain that, well, this is dangerous. The use of these performance-enhancing drugs is dangerous. But the mere participation in some of these sports is dangerous. The average age of an NFL lineman is in their 50s. People willingly give up decades of their potential lifespan to play football. And other sports have similar situations, maybe not as drastic as football or mixed martial arts, but every sport presents some sort of risk to the person who's engaging in it. We allow all these adults to make these decisions to put their bodies on the line and their potential lifespans on the line in pursuit of chasing a ball or ra racing around a track. But we do not give these adults the same ability to decide what chemicals they're going to put inside their bodies to do those activities. Now, some would complain that this is dangerous and it's unfair. Those who would want to dope are putting themselves at risk, but then they force others who wish to be clean athletes to have to dope to compete. But the point that we should be making here is that there is nothing necessarily inherently dangerous in using these performance enhancing drugs if they're under doctor supervision. People like Lance Armstrong or your typical NBA multimillionaire or NFL multimillionaire doesn't want to risk their livelihood and their life too too much. They don't want to push the edge too much. They don't want to have it risking their their health and and their their long life. Let's give them the opportunity to do so. They already make the decisions that hurt them in the first place. And as far as it being cheating, I, I hear this a, a lot too about uh, it being cheating, being unfair, inflating statistics. Uh, this happened a lot during the Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire years when they were pumping out home runs like crazy and having that big home run derby. And uh, people complained that it distorted the record books because Babe Ruth never got to use steroids or anything like this. Well, that's true. But Babe Ruth also never had the benefit of modern uh, uh, sports drinks. Babe Ruth never had the benefit of uh, nu uh, enhanced nutrition that we have today. He never had Nautilus machines to be able to work out specific muscle groups. He didn't have years and years of sports medicine uh, experts around him that could coach him on every fine point of how to be a better pitcher or a better hitter. He didn't have the benefit of arthroscopic knee surgery or Tommy John elbow surgery. He didn't have the benefit of modern gloves and modern uh, production uh, capabilities for bats or the the pads that might be worn by some batters. I mean, to try to compare previous eras based on whether or not someone was using a chemical enhancement seems ridiculous to me when we have so many surgical, nutritional, and training enhancements that make the athletes of today so much better than the athletes of yesteryear. There is no way an offensive lineman from the Packers uh, championship teams of the 60s, who would be about my size, could possibly compete as an NFL lineman today. That's just progress and evolution. If you ask me, it's time to let adult athletes be adults and to stop trying these futile attempts, obviously futile attempts, if he got away with the Tour de France for seven years, winning it for seven years and was never caught. And now if he they they you know vacate his wins on those Tour de France and they give it to the other guys who finish second or third, who cares? Do you know who those guys are? The only time I ever paid attention to baseball were when Sosa and uh, McGuire were swatting home runs like crazy. The only time I ever paid attention to cycling is when Lance Armstrong was winning seven, uh, seven of these things in a row. Let's let adults be adults. Let's have our uh, uh, athletic excitement be a little more exciting and, and go ahead and allow the chemical enhancements that are no more, no more unethical than surgical 
training and nutrition enhancements in sport. That's my opinion behind the headlines. When we come back, we're going to get our daily toker tunes from Yo Mama's Big Fat Booty Band. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Big Daddy thinks. Funky roller rink, roller rink, roller rink. Oh yeah, this is Big Daddy, and I'll be your freakazoid every Thursday night, right here at the Funky Roller Rink. Mm. Funky Roller Rink. 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, only on RadicalRust.com. Go, go. Bellville Show. Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, time for some Groovin' Thursday music, and this comes from our good friend Big Daddy Fink from Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink. You're going to catch a new episode of the Funky Roller Rink tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific. You want to check that out. And if you missed last week's Funky Roller Rink, just stay online here because at 3 o'clock Pacific time, about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes from now, you're going to get last week's episode of Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink to whet your appetite until 8 o'clock when we can get the new funk happening. It's all the best of the funk, disco, R&B, and soul from the late 70s and early 80s. Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink tonight, 8 o'clock Pacific, with replays all weekend long, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in our music block. Check out our calendar at RadicalRust.com. Dot com for more details. Like I said, we got big, Yo Mama's Big Fat Booty Band. <laughs> I keep thinking Big Daddy Fink on that, so I got to make sure that I get everything right here. But uh, we got Yo Mama's Big Fat Booty Band is joining us here for the show today. And uh, just want to let you know, this is uh, one of our favorite bands. Let's get to it. We got video here. This is the video for Lovin' from Yo Mama's Big Fat Booty Band.
That's your mama's big fat booty band. Thanks to Big Daddy Fink for that one. Check out more tonight, 8 o'clock Pacific on Big Daddy Fink. Funky Roller Rink. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. And now, a message from former President George W. Bush to remind the American people of our responsibility in our nation's war on certain American citizens who are not pharmaceutical, non alcoholic, tobacco free drugs. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. That's right, America, use less drugs. Put down the Prozac, the Vioxx, and the Levitra, and turn to the herb. Use less drugs. Our national policy is no longer just say no, it's now just slow down. You get me too high. I overanalyze. If you've ever been too high, then you can sympathize. You get me too, too high. Marijuana re-legalization is not likely to happen first at the federal level. It's going to happen state by state. We turn now to our 50 state legislatures and assemblies for the Russ Belleville Show's Legalization Legislation Update. We got video from the normal national conference in L.A. featuring all three Medical state initiatives. Has overcome a lot of fear. Hempfest has overcome a lot of fear. I-502 will overcome a lot of fear. I'm lucky to live in a pretty progressive state. I believe in Washington state that people understand that we will never have this utopian drug-free society. We don't need to win over the people that like the, the concept of recreational drugs. We need to convince the people that don't like the idea of recreational drugs that your pipe dream of a drug-free society is never, ever going to happen. What we need to do is deal with reality and deal with it smartly. And I'm pretty excited that uh, with the help of so many people, Ethan and DPA and all the inspiration I've had from Keith and Ellen and, and normal friends, we're going to do it in Washington State. that we're trying to convey to people. So in Colorado, you won't really hear us talking about legalization so much as much as regulation and the fact that regulation works with getting marijuana off the streets and behind the counters is a better way. Um, so I'm here as, as the co-director and representative, but uh, I did want to briefly acknowledge uh, some of the other folks working on the campaign, including uh, the, the key support we've gotten from the Marijuana Policy Project. I'm not sure if Rob Campy is in the room, but he has just been working incredibly hard to bring very significant financial funding to our to our campaign. I also want to acknowledge Steve Fox uh, from MPP and Mason DeBerg, who was the co-director along with me. Uh, those guys have been working 24-7 for about two years uh, to bring this to us, and, and we're about a month away, so the excitement is, is really palpable. Um, so, you know, this in Colorado, what we've done over the past 10 or so years is really kind of build the foundation for this initiative through two main avenues, one being medical marijuana. Uh, we've really worked quite hard to establish our state as sort of a model for how marijuana can be effectively taxed and regulated. Uh, and if it can be taxed and regulated uh, safely for communities and, and sold to patients, you know, we believe we've sent a message that can be done so for uh, responsible adults 21 and over. And then also through uh, just consistent earned media pushes and ballot initiatives to really uh, introduce the public to the fact that, that marijuana is not the demon weed that they've heard. In fact, it's safer than alcohol, which has been sort of theme for our campaign as well. And, and really just kind of, in this way, make the ground fertile for this vote. And we're getting we're getting pretty close. I mean, we're consistently uh, ahead by five to 10 points, sometimes as much as 12 in the polls. Uh, that has us anywhere as high as 53% support and 56 with some, some further some education. Um, so we think it's gonna be a, a damn close election. Um, 
What, the way we came at this, I think, is a little different um, than perhaps some of the way this is done previously or the way, the way some people on this table came forward. And that's why I think what happens uh, on November 6th is going to be so interesting because we have you know, pretty different models in Washington versus Colorado versus Oregon, and we're going to learn a lot kind of know what, no matter what happens. We consider Colorado a real consensus law. Uh, we spent about six months drafting this. We brought in every national player we could, uh, the smartest people from DPA, uh, normal from uh, the ACLU, national, and then we also reached out to stakeholders within Colorado. And I think that differentiates us from, from Washington. I'm not here to in any way um, point the finger. I just think what we did in Colorado is we reached out to medical marijuana stakeholders, people that you know, I've worked closely with over the years, and said, what do you guys want to see in this language? You know, you're the people that put your asses on the line selling marijuana for the last several years. Um, you know, what would you like to see? We don't want to in, in any way uh, rock the boat for you guys. We'd also like you to benefit uh, from the passage of this. And in doing so, uh, we made this sort of conscious decision to reach out to and embrace the base, right? The base of people that support marijuana reform. And because of, that, of doing this, you know, we really haven't had significant uh, defection, maybe as we saw in Prop 19, maybe as at least we're seeing some headlines in Washington of medical marijuana people. Dominic was talking about this, they have marijuana legalization advocates that are against it. We just haven't seen that in Colorado. Now, whether or not that is going to lead to victory, you know, uh, whether that outreach uh, will actually result in, in us ultimately being victorious, I'm not really sure. But I can tell you it has been psychologically uh, useful. <laughs> and we haven't been attacked uh, by our friends for the last several years, and that, that feels good, you know. And I'll talk about why I believe those folks lined up uh, behind our, our law. Um, quickly, what our amendment does is really three things. Uh, again, we're going to regulate marijuana like Alcohol Act. Uh, it's for adults 21 and over. Uh, it will allow uh, those individuals to possess up to an ounce privately and also to grow six plants. And that's a key difference between our initiative in Washington. And we pulled on this and went back and forth. And, and, and you know, it, it may hurt us a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, we felt like to be as, as pure or true to our ideals of what we'd like to see with legalization, this is what we want to push. And, and I would say I'm happy it has not been something we've really been attacked uh, by uh, on the campaign trail. The opposition, which is fairly organized um, in Colorado, has not really been jumping up and down on this point. Um, so we feel, we feel okay about it. And again, when, when we do, when this comes up at debates and debating cops and DAs every single week, uh, we say, listen, we're regulating marijuana like alcohol. You know, I can brew beer in Colorado if I want to, but if I start selling it, you know, I have to apply to become coerced, right? Or I can be criminally prosecuted. So this is, we want adults to have the right to do this. And by the way, how many adults do you know that brew beer? Almost none. You know, they go down to the corner store and buy a regulated tax product. So, you know, that's the way we're kind of messaging that. The second piece of, of Amendment 64 uh, will allow Colorado to set up a, a regulatory structure to license retail marijuana stores, cultivation facilities, um, labs, and infused product manufacturers. Now, the good thing is Colorado already has a, a wing of our government, the Department of Revenue, that licenses all four of those entities for medical marijuana. We've been doing it for several years. It's worked rather well. Uh, so I think this is crystallized in people's minds as something that can be done. Now, an important piece with there in that regulatory structure is we allow communities to opt out. Right? They can't opt out of adults possessing marijuana because that'll you know, be the right under our state criminal laws. But they can say, we don't want these stores in our community. And, and that may rub some of you the wrong way, but ultimately, it's, it's like alcohol. Right? You can have dry communities, you can have wet communities, and we believe that community should be able to decide what they want to do on that piece. A key portion of the regulatory uh, structure is tax. Right? And what we did was we allocated the first $40 million annually to public school construction every single year. Right? And we estimate, it's been estimated this will bring in about 60 million or so in new tax revenue. So a very, very significant chunk of that is earmarked for public school construction. And I believe that's going to be one of the key pieces that helps us win. When, when I'm out there talking to the League of Women Voters and other senior groups and whatnot, you know, there's a lot of heads nodding when we talk about the fact that schools are crumbling and we need to infuse serious money. And that, by the way, that 40 million can be bonded into a quarter billion dollars. So it's, it's very significant for a, a you know, relatively small state like ours. The final piece uh, uh, that this amendment will do is it will make Colorado the, the first state in the country to allow the domestic uh, production of hemp, right, industrial hemp. And this is something that yeah. we're very happy about having that piece in there. And it's just interestingly, 
it never comes up. <laughs> and our, our opponents don't even know it's in there, and it's just like fascinating. So um, we hope to win. We hope to really allow Colorado farmers to go you know, put in marijuana anyhow. Um, just quickly, kind of where we're headed from here, we are going to be hitting the ground uh, just in about 10 days with some really excellent TV ads. Um, there's about 15% undecided in our state on the issue of marijuana, which always kind of blows my mind because who doesn't know where they're at on this issue. But the point is, I think those people are actually with us. They just need to know that we're here. They need to know what our initiative does. And we believe we can reach them with the uh, significant TV ads that we're going to be running here shortly. Um, we're going to continue on with our earned media you know, stunts and uh, rolling out you know, endorsements and so forth. Um, and then uh, you know, also have a you know, field program. I mean, it's interesting, Colorado is such a targeted state you know, it's, it's safe to say that I mean, Obama and Romney are in Colorado like every three days. It's totally overwhelming. It's great for our campaign because we get to go to those events and have literature. But uh, they know that they need to win Colorado. And a lot of the field work, you know, a lot of the getting people to the polls is going to be done by the Obama campaign and, and to some extent by the Romney campaign. So a lot of our efforts have not been focused on that field program. Uh, we do have a you know, somewhat significant field program, but largely we're just working on you know, speaking and, and media and uh, paid ads at this point. So um, so I guess, you know, just to, to sort of summarize, I mean, I think we have sort of two paths, and, and it is very interesting, as Rick pointed out, you know, what happens in November if, if, if uh, you know, Colorado wins and Washington doesn't, uh, which which is the template moving on? Uh, you know, if, we, if Colorado wins and then it's home grow, you know, okay in your state, it, it may appear that way. We also don't touch DUID, right, driving and influence marijuana. We just explicitly do not address that. And that may hurt us. You know, that may hurt us at the polls. Um, but we, we did not feel comfortable writing a, a standard of, of, of uh, you know, driving the things. And, and Washington did. So we'll see what happens in November. Maybe that's, maybe that's the correct template to, to pass legalization. You know, that's, that's the sort of exciting things that we're going to see in November. Thanks. Well, I'm Roy Kaufman. I'm the manager and communications director for the Yes on 80 campaign in Oregon, vote80.org. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how we are similar and uh, a little different from the other two states. But first, a little bit of historical context. Uh, in 1932, uh, Oregon voters passed Measure 7. Measure 7 was the state repeal of liquor prohibition. If you're a history buff, you'll remember that alcohol prohibition wasn't repealed federally until 1933. So uh, when we go and we talk to communities, especially the seniors, but just in general, one of the first things we point out is we've done this before. We have moved before the federal government has moved. We have shown that states can be leaders. In fact, they have to be leaders on issues where the federal government can't or won't go first. Uh, when we make that message and then we begin to talk about how alcohol prohibition uh, damaged our country, how it benefited uh, criminals and made everybody else victims, uh, it becomes a very useful uh, segue to a conversation about marijuana prohibition. And then when we continue that segue and continue that conversation, we point to some of the facts on the ground. I don't know if you, if you spent your time in Oregon. Oregon uh, is known as Nirvana. It is one of the microbrew capitals of the world. Uh, it is uh, a booming wine country. It's got incredible craft uh, distillers. So there's, an, uh, there's a, a wonderful, vibrant liquor industry in Oregon that is state regulated. Um, and that is the exact same industry that uh, in the 1920s uh, was illegal. It was illegal to make beer. It was illegal even to grow hops. Uh, we have stories of farmers who had their hops farms ripped out uh, because hops were used to make beer and that violated Federal Prohibition Act. Uh, and you fast forward to 2010, the beer and wine industries in Oregon were a $5 billion a year industry in total economic impact, 10,000 jobs in Oregon. Um, so what we do is we talk to voters and we let them know that prohibition doesn't work because when you prohibit something, uh, you automatically make it very, very sexy. You make it very, very appealing. Um, you know, if the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden weren't forbidden, nobody would have eaten it. So, you know, when we talk about prohibition, we say it doesn't work, and here's how we know it doesn't work. And on marijuana, we know prohibition doesn't work, but regulation does, and regulation can work. 
a lot of the similar messages that you hear out of the other states talking about youth safety, talking about uh, getting marijuana out of the hands of kids and, uh, and regulating it responsibly uh, are messages that we know resonate with, with voters. And all we have to do is we have to point to the fact that liquor use uh, by teens is at a record low. Tobacco use by teens is at a record low. Marijuana use by teens is at a record high. Because we strongly regulate, educate, and enforce on those other industries. And yet we pretend that prohibition will somehow deliver equal results. So you know, that's, that, is the, that is the framework. That is how we approach the conversation in Oregon. In terms of uh, Measure 80, uh, it is, it is it's fair to say that it's probably the most um, far-reaching of the three measures. It's most similar in design and in nature to Colorado uh, in that it is a regulate and tax uh, bill. It will set up a new state commission, the Oregon Cannabis Commission, which is modeled on the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, which, uh, which regulates uh, liquor sales in Oregon. Uh, it sets up a state commission. It's uh, 21 and above. It maintains all of the DUII penalties, all of the provision to minor sale to minor penalties that are currently in place around liquor. It doesn't include a specific DUII testing approach or level, uh, but it does, uh, it does provide for funding for new technologies to be able to test for those things in a, in a realistic and responsible way. And looking at Europe's model of, uh, of recent use testing as opposed to blood level testing. Uh, it is also uh, a bill that strongly pushes the message of industrial hemp. Oregon is a, an agricultural state, it's a manufacturing state. A lot of the industries that would benefit from uh, agricultural hemp are currently industries that are suffering greatly in this economic situation. Those are textiles, pulp and paper mills, uh, the, our timber industry, our manufacturing industry, our biofuels industry. There are biofuel refineries that have been closing left and right because they can't afford to buy corn for ethanol and they are eager to be able to buy hemp to make hemp biofuel. And they'd rather be able to buy that hemp from an Oregon farmer than from someone in China or Mexico or Canada. Uh, so the hemp message is a very important one, but there's no doubt that when we're talking to media, uh, you know, they're not really talking about hemp. When people, when people go to vote, they will vote on whether or not they want to end marijuana prohibition. And, and so where we stand in Oregon, uh, we qualify for the ballot in mid-July, this mid-July. So it's, a, it's been a, a mad dash uh, to, to election day. Uh, the other initiatives qualify in January, February of this year. And so the undecided margins are smaller and the numbers are stronger. But where we are right now is basically evenly split. Uh, Oregonians are about 40-40, uh, with 20% undecided on this issue. And what's interesting about Oregon, in case you're not familiar with the uh, Oregon electoral system, why would you be, uh, is uh, it's, an, it's an entirely vote-by-mail state. There, there are no polling places on election day. It is entirely vote-by-mail, which means that uh, ballot go out the mail October 19th. People can start voting as soon as they get their ballots. They have until November 6th to turn those ballots in. They also get a packet of information, a voter's guide, that has arguments in favor, arguments against, uh, and that's where we feel we have an incredible opportunity to reach the undecided voters who study this issue very closely. Oregon voters are known for deliberating over these decisions very, very closely, very carefully. And we have, in our ballot statements, uh, some of our strongest endorsers and some of our strongest messages. UFCW, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, endorsed us very early on. They see this as a jobs opportunity. We're grateful to have organized labor on board. NAACP endorsed early on. Uh, this is a civil rights issue, if nothing else. Uh, we have public safety, like LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We're very grateful to have their support. And then we've had a number of major uh, democratic uh, lawmakers and former lawmakers come out and endorse our former state sec uh, secretary of state has endorsed. Uh, yesterday we had a state senate, Republican state senate candidate endorsed, and tomorrow I'm actually driving down to Bend, Oregon to present to the Republican state central committee meeting on this issue. Um, you know, Oregon, because it's not a battleground state like Colorado, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of spending, we don't see a lot of time from, from uh, the Democrat or Republican presidential campaigns. What we do see a lot of time is from the Libertarian and Green Party campaigns. 
And those are both parties that are very, very strong in Oregon. Because Oregon has a very strong independent libertarian green streak. And on this issue, Gary Johnson has endorsed us, Jill Stein has endorsed us, and they come out to Oregon, they help us get the message out. So we're, we're optimistic that between the independent-minded voters, the Democrats that are already on board, and conservatives who are looking at this as an issue of fiscal responsibility, an issue of states' rights, an issue of individual liberty, uh, that we can, uh, we can squeak by and, and make some history in Oregon. So I'm looking forward to telling you more about it. Ethan, I want to bring you into this, and at least to get the discussion started, I thought of two things that your perspective might be helpful with. Uh, you obviously have a great deal of experience with your Washington, D.C. office dealing with Congress and the federal government. Uh, it'd be interesting to have your perspective on what you expect. Let's assume all three of these win. How do you expect the federal government will respond? And then the second point might be for a lot of people out there who I'm sure are beginning to think, boy, in two years or four years, I want to do this in my state. What are the tips for how do you qualify or how do you satisfy funders that it's a professional operation? Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, and maybe start with the second one and then, and then turn to the first, because it goes to how the feds might respond to all this. And, uh, and thank you for your kind introduction. I only wish what you said about the donors were as true um, as you portrayed it. That would be actually wonderful if it were that true. But by the way, man, I simply say uh, it goes all the way back to Prop 215, whereas I think all you people know, Ethan Nagelman was brought in and bailed out Prop 215, but it would not have qualified for the ballot. So he deserved it. Well, thank you. Let me say, I think that the, uh, the most important thing for, for getting support for a ballot initiative in the state and this is what I told a range of activists all around the country. Because we don't, we, we typically don't initiate or pick out the state in advance. We did it more in the late 90s, but not more recently. It's often it's initiated by local activists. It's really that at the get-go, what we want to know is that in the state, there's already a serious majority of people in favor of marijuana legalization at the get-go. One thing we've learned is that to think that you can use a ballot initiative campaign to educate the public or to move the public is mostly not true. By and large, the role of the ballot initiative process, which exists in about half the states, is to transform majoritarian public opinion into state law when the state legislature and or the governor are unable or unwilling to do so. And we know that in the case of marijuana reform, medical marijuana, DTRIM, legalization, as well as other drug policy reform issues, where typically you see the politicians following the public, this is an opportunity to do right by the ballot initiative process. It's a process which has been used, I think, for great evil many times by very well-funded interests, and in our case, obviously, for great good, because we're really getting behind the interests of people who are oftentimes the least empowered in the political system. Now, the conventional wisdom for a long time has been that you need to go in with something of at least 57, 58 percent on your side getting, go, getting going, and not much more than 40 percent against. And then anything short of that, you're likely to lose. Why? Well, a few reasons. First of all, if you ask people to vote yes and no on a ballot initiative and they know absolutely nothing about it, more people are going to vote no instead of yes. There's just an inclination of the public, no, not yes, on something law or whatever, right? So you, you already lose a few points there. Then you have the fact that people get scared of change. We saw in California with Prop 19, even after the election, the exit polls, more people said that they were in favor of marijuana legalization than against. But they got scared in the last minute, they were scared of change, this provision worried them, whatever it might be, right? So you know you're going to drop off. Then, of course, the last few weeks, typically, our opposition mobilizes. In the issue of marijuana reform, unlike bigger prison reform, where we run into the prison guards and establish financial interests who pour millions against us, so far, on the marijuana reform initiatives, we haven't seen major money. But what they do is you get all the cops lining up, the politicians, to try to bring in the feds, the attorney general, the drug czar, to try to speak out against and scare people in the last few weeks. That's why these things are hard to win. It's why, even though we see majorities in favor, at least as far as I've seen in Colorado and Washington, I'm still really nervous. I'm still really nervous. 
It's why in California, you know, all, I mean, although, you know, as I've said many times, you know, I, I think Richard Lee, although I tried to dissuade him from doing the initiative initially, because it was not a presidential election year, it would be hard to win, I think it was the right move, because it transformed the national dialogue. But then, Right? It did not actually advance public support for marijuana legalization in California, but I think it did advance it in other parts of the country, right? Because people saw that this was real and this could almost win. The debate actually helped move things there, right? But there was only ever one week in California where I said, God, this could really win, right? And that was actually the end of the September, early October, where the numbers were staying high. And then they dropped dramatically like a week later, right? So there's this moment. And I was still able to speak honestly, Kate talked about the donors, to go to the donors and say, look, you know, this thing's an uphill battle. It's got some shot, but it's going to be transformative for the country. And able to at least raise some money in the final stretch. It would have been better if I raised it earlier, but at least in the final stretch to, to, to get that there. Now, I think that, um, you know, with Washington, Colorado, um, and this, by the way, goes to Keith's issue about, you know, the, about the donors as well. With the wealthy donors, I mean, look, some of this is just deeply personal. Some of it is idiosyncratic. A lot of it is how well one leverages the money you're able to raise and where the opportunities are to leverage. Sometimes more money goes to one dish than another because the opportunities for leveraging other donors are greater in that case than in others. I mean, it's a complex set of dynamics. These are people, you know, one thing about wealthy donors oftentimes is they like to roll the dice. They like to roll the money and let's see what's going to happen, right? It's sometimes easier to raise non-tax deductible money for an initiative than it is to raise it for a non-profit tax deductible, you know, advocacy organization because they're, they're, they're businessmen. They want to roll, they want to win, they want to lose and all that, right? But it's also, there's a whole set of dynamics that go, that goes into that. When I look at the Washington and Colorado initiatives, DPA, we were deeply involved in the drafting and research on the, on the Colorado initiative. And we have an office in Colorado now. We're invested in Colorado for the long term. Washington State, we advised and consulted. Right now, DPA, and I should say here, it's not Drug Policy Alliance, it's our 501c4 Drug Policy Action, is putting a lot of money into Washington State. Why? In part, because with, in part because of the funder dynamics, in part because of the political dynamics, in part because of people like Rick Steves and others who are stepping up both publicly and with their pocketbooks, in part because what's going on in Washington State now, the dynamic that, that, that Rick described of law enforcement, the entire government of the city council, the Seattle mayor, and the sheriffs, and two former U.S. attorneys, and the former head of the FBI, and newspapers, and all the major cities in Washington State, and the Children's Alliance, and the I mean, all of this has created a dynamic where when potential donors see that, they go, this is real, this could really happen. they created a context, an atmosphere, whereas we're not having breakfast before, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's almost like not cool to be against this initiative. Right? I mean, even the statewide politicians are like kind of sheepish about being on the other side or they're trying to stay neutral. <laughs> Colorado, which has polling that it's just about as good as Washington State, hasn't had that same dynamic, right? So, I mean, and, and if I look at the two initiatives, right? I mean, the truth is the Colorado initiative, in terms of where I'm coming from as a matter of principle, I like the Colorado initiative better. Right? It goes more on core principles, it retains the right of personal cultivation, it doesn't get into some of that DUID thing in a way that I think could be problematic. But I look at the Washington State Initiative, which leaned over backwards to reassure the swing voter. Because we know with the swing voter, right, they care about the kids issue, the workplace issue, the roads issue. And Washington State, in taking a more conservative approach and getting out, going out of their way to reassure the swing voter, the concerned parent, I think has actually put itself in a potentially better chance to win. Now, I'll tell you this, my biggest guilt right now is that I haven't been able to raise more money from Colorado. And I'm deeply grateful to Rock Camp and NDP for the money they're raising there. I mean, it's pivotal that they're getting the money put on TV, and I'm committed to trying to do what I can in the last few weeks, even though it's getting late to do that stuff. But it means going forward, right, it's a key question, it means if you want to do this in the state, I and Drug Policy Alliance, we're going to help any initiative that's credible, right? If you come to us, we're going to help with drafting and research the best we can. The more the public is already there, the more we're going to be able and willing to help. I mean, that's key. To do it in a state where you only got 40% going in, can't prioritize that. We have limited resources. It's got to be that sort of thing. Now, to keep the question, what's Washington going to do? Um, you know, I, 
First of all, we have to see whether or not Holder the drugs are going to show up in the next month and try to do what they did in California for, uh, two years ago or in other states as well. I'm hoping they don't, right? I mean, they can look at the numbers. They see the country's evenly split on this issue. They see that a majority of the age of 50, a majority of Democrats and defendants are in favor of marijuana legalization. They don't want to alienate young voters. But on the other hand, I don't expect Obama to be bold because by being bold, he'll alienate the whole law enforcement constituency and all the people that he also needs on that side, right? So, but what we want them to do is just stay out. I do worry about two significant things after the election, if, if one of these wins. The first one is what's going on in the courts. Many of you are familiar with the PAC decision, the PAC case in California involving medical marijuana. And fortunately, that was rendered moot, and it's not, you know, but that, there's a serious risk that a case could go up to the Supreme Court, and where the, the Supreme Court upholds the ability of the federal government to preempt all of this statewide regulation of medical marijuana and a potentially legal regulatory model. And if that happens, depending on how strong that decision is, we have a major problem. Because part of what, you know, uh, Roy was talking about, about the, the, the state repeals of alcohol prohibition was they didn't set up alcohol regulatory models before 33. They just repealed the state prohibition laws. So we know we can repeal state marijuana prohibition laws, but in terms of setting up a regulatory system, which is what the public's going to need down the road in order to be reassured and not have this thing go, for example, what happened in Montana on medical marijuana, we're going to need that. So it's a real risk on the courts. The second risk, of course, it's going to be, what is the White House going to do? What are those U.S. attorneys going to do? You see what they're doing on medical marijuana. What are they going to do in this case? Congress, part of it depends upon whether or not Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House again, or whether or not we still have Lamar Smith or some other Republican chairing the House Judiciary Committee. That's going to shape things. So I do worry about what the feds are going to do. I do think it's conceivable that we could win one of these initiatives this year, and I'm doing everything possible, and it can actually make it harder to win another initiative in 2016 because the feds will come back and slam it down so hard that people will get nervous. Notwithstanding that, we have to do everything we can to win this year and then figure out how to manage the process so we can win a bunch more in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because we were starting a little late, I don't want to go too far over our schedule, but I think we might have time for a couple of questions, and there is a microphone back there in the middle of the room, so if a couple of you want to get some questions, and then we'll bring Eric to the next panel up, maybe 10 minutes. Yes. All right, folks, that's all the time we have here for our first hour at the Russ Belleville Show. Thanks to everybody listening by podcast.